Welcome back to another episode of Rami Umptum Ruminations. My name is Scott and I'm the host. Today's episode is called Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Thanks for coming back to another episode. For today's episode, I'm going to read an essay that one of the listeners wrote on a very fascinating subject. I may not read the entirety of the essay, but I'll, I'll highlight some of the key points of what this listener was trying to put together. And I think it will lead for a fascinating discussion and some great insights into how we look at religion, both from the believer's perspective and from a non-believer's perspective. Before I get to the bulk of the content for this episode, it's been a few weeks since I've done that shameless self-plug, so I'll throw that out there right here. Thank you so much to the listeners that have donated to the podcast and those that are considering donating. I greatly appreciate any contribution that can be made. A dollar a month, one-time donation, whatever it is. Everything is appreciated. For those that haven't done it yet and are financially able, the best place to find that is to go to the ramiumptumruminations.org website. And on the right-hand side of the page, if you're on the browser or if you're on your phone, it's at the very bottom of the page. So you got to scroll for a sec before you can find it. That is where you can become a monthly recurring donator to support the show. The second item of business, I mentioned a couple weeks back that I'm getting real close to my one year podcasting mark. That's going to happen not next week, but the following week. Uh, For those off in the distant future, it's middle of June of 2022. I asked a couple of weeks ago for questions, things that you guys wanted me to talk about or or answer about me or or about my beliefs or how I got to where I'm at. Um, And I've received a couple of questions already. If you have something that you'd like to ask me, please reach out to send those questions my way. I would prefer them to come through either Facebook or the contact me at uh, the ramiumptumruminations.org website. Those ones are guaranteed to get to me. If you post it on one of the various podcasting platforms, I might not be able to see it before I record the episode. And as I said, I've gotten a couple of questions already. I've gone ahead and, and recorded some answers to those. And I'm looking forward to, to putting that out as kind of a celebration of one year of doing this and hopefully to kick off many more years of podcasting. I did have a listener on one of the platforms ask how they could reach out to me. Um, the easiest two ways, like I said just a minute ago, would be either to shoot me a message on Facebook Messenger or go to the website, ramiumptumruminations.org, and uh, go to contact me. That will send me an email. And uh, if you have a question or if you want to correspond, that's a great way to reach out to me. If you've listened for a while, I love interacting with listeners. And I oftentimes, with permission from the listeners, will use some of the things that we discuss as a jumping off point for an episode down the road. If that's something that interests you, please feel free to reach out anytime. The essay that I want to read is from a listener named Brock. He sent me his thoughts on the subject of trusting in the Lord, and he wanted to hear what I thought about it. And in his essay, he articulated it very well. It was, it was, uh, it was a, an excellent read. So I'm going to read some of the highlights of what he said and use those as a jumping off point for our discussion. Now, the title of the episode is a reference to the scripture in Jeremiah 17, verse 5. And that is in the King James Version, because that's what's familiar to those in the post-Mormon and the uh, nuanced Mormon spaces. Um, the The King James Version of that scripture says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. 
The Book of Mormon also makes use of, of that same sort of motif of like the arm of flesh. And in uh, 2 Nephi 4, 34, it says, O Lord, I have trusted in thee and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, cursed is he that putteth his trust in man or maketh flesh his arm. So you have some, whether you believe it's divinely inspired or not, you do have some sort of exchange of ideas happening between this uh, scripture in Jeremiah and this in in uh, Second Nephi. But this this idea of putting your trust in the arm of flesh creates a sort of problem. It almost takes the idea of faith and knowledge out of context from the way that our world actually operates. And this listener pointed it out wonderfully. So I'm going to jump in and read some of the things that he said. He starts off by quoting Descartes. He says, I think, therefore, I am. A French philosopher, René Descartes, once claimed, it's a profound statement. I've spent a long time thinking about it over the years. And its claim, implicit or explicit, to an existence independent of his predecessors. But how did he start thinking? How did you or I start? Who structured his thoughts? Or ours, for that matter? Who gave him the language with which to formulate his thoughts? Who gave him the tools to reevaluate them? I am neither the first nor the best to question the bedrock from which he built his worldview. Reading Descartes is really fascinating. He's got some great ideas. And, and this idea, I think, therefore I am, is, is probably his most famous one. It's, it's fascinating. When you start breaking it down the way that this listener did, you begin to understand that even though we are doing this thinking, the language that we're using is a tool that was given to us by our parents and their parents. These systems that we use are not unique to us. Then he follows it up with this thought. He says, on the other hand, one of my favorite operating systems is called Ubuntu, which translates to something like, I am because we are, or as the French philosopher might put it, we are, therefore I am, which is interesting because the word we includes the self. In other words, I plural am, therefore I singular am. I really like this this point that he that he's addressing right here. It's something that I have done a fair amount of thinking about as well. We oftentimes individualize ourselves in our minds and take ourselves out of the context of the society that we come from and and the family and the people that we associate with. But we are both a an individual and a plural in very interesting ways. You know, we're an individual consciousness thinking and and operating we're a plural in the sense of our families and our friends, or even, you know, you could go on the grander cosmic scale. You say we're a plural of, of the whole planet that we exist on. Like we exist codependently with all of these systems of the world that we live in, where thinking of yourself as an individual is almost taking yourself out of context of the bigger picture of the world around us. And so the idea of, I think, therefore I am, this, this I am, like, what is that? Like, what are we? Because we're not fully individuals and we're not fully a plurality of our society. Like, yes, we are human, but we are just this one human too. It's a really interesting interplay of, of ideas and concepts. As the listeners wrapping up those sentiments, he, he changes course of his, of his uh, line of thought here and presents an interesting contradiction with the way belief is treated um, both scripturally and in the rhetoric of, of the church. He brings up the phrase in Second uh, Nephi that I read at the outset, Second Nephi 4.34, and he says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding, uh, then he says, or Nephi's assertion that he will trust in the Lord forever and will not put his trust in the arm of flesh. How can one trust in the Lord without trusting in the arm of flesh? It seems to me that in order to trust in the Lord, one must, and he numbers four things, trust someone else's testimony of him, desire one's own testimony, trust someone else's testimony that all can receive their own testimony and seek out one's own spiritual confirmation. 
uh, then he brings up another of a number of questions that this line of reasoning uh, might lead to. He says, assuming God responded, how would one recognize it as distinctly from him? The only response I can imagine is coming from another fleshy arm, so to speak. In that case, any search for personal testimony is necessarily planted by a community, nourished by a community, nourished by one's own fleshy arms, or confirmed by a community of fleshy arms. And then he, he ends his essay with this. He says, I've searched and prayed and tried, but I see no defensible path from trusting in the arm of flesh to trusting in the arm of God. Is it possible then to transform faith in men to faith in God? If so, how? If not, what sets the prophet apart from anyone else in terms of his primordial dependence on fleshy arms? So to address this, I want to, I want to complicate the situation a little bit further and talk about some more ways that everything about religion is presented by this arm of flesh and even if you believe that it came from God, it is indistinguishable from coming from anything but man from this earth. If you study the, the, the way that any of the ancient scriptures were compiled and put together, they were done from different men and women across generations of time and put together by other men and women and re-edited and recompiled. For the New Testament, the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, as they're called, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written not during the time of Christ and apparently not even by eyewitnesses of Christ or of his life. The names given to them were not added until till the second century CE. And before that, they were just anonymous accounts of the life of Christ. The earliest written was the book of Mark, typically dated between 66 and the year 70 CE. The next two would be the books of Matthew and Luke, written between 85 and 90 CE, with the last book being the book of John, and scholars typically date this between 90 and 110 CE, kind of depending on the scholar. Interestingly, the books of Matthew and Luke appear to borrow a lot of their content, um, making some adjustments, but they, they seem to be using the book of Mark as inspiration or as a source material for some of the things that they discuss in them. The book of John is a bit different. It has the most unique stories and doesn't appear to be borrowing from the other gospels as often as Matthew and Luke do. Now, the reason I bring this up, and, and this is the interesting thing, during the time of Christ, and if we're going to say that we're believers and that the great apostasy was a thing that happened, immediately following the time of Christ, there was no established canon of scripture. Each enclave or different group around the Mediterranean that followed Christ had a distinct set of scriptures that they were using and reading to learn about Christ. One group might have had Luke and Acts and some of the epistles, maybe not all of the epistles. Another enclave might have had Matthew or John and some of the epistles. Each group had access to a different set of scriptures. The canon as we know it today did not exist immediately following the time of Christ. When you study the way all of the scriptures that we have, when you study the way that they were put together, it's clear that it was done by man. This complicates it just a little bit, but the LDS belief of the apostasy has some inconsistencies here because during the life of Christ, there was no canonized set of New Testament scriptures. And if the great apostasy happened a generation after Christ passed away, then none of the New Testament scriptures that we have would be in a canon 
well, that, that isn't a problem in itself, but the canon that we use today wasn't finalized until 367 AD by a bishop in Alexandria by the name of Athanasius. And he compiled this a list of 27 books that he considered to be canon. It was, uh, it was later formalized in, in like the councils of Hippo in 393, and then again in Carthage in 397. These councils also addressed which books of the Old Testament would be canon as well. But if, if we're going to say that, that this canon of scripture from the New Testament is the word of God, it comes from a time during the great, the great apostasy when there was, or I'm talking about this, through the parameters and the constraints of being a believer. The New Testament, as studied by the modern LDS church, comes from a time during the great apostasy. So they use this canon of scripture, even though they believe that at that time, nobody had authority or inspiration in order to receive the word of God. So who would have told them that this was the exact canon that they were supposed to have believed in and that they were supposed to have trusted? Why throw out any of the infancy gospels, the infancy gospel of James or the infancy gospel of Thomas, which if you haven't read the Thomas one, it's hilarious. It's, it's definitely worth a read. In that one, Jesus is presented as kind of like a, a brat kid that curses people and, <laughs> you know, makes these parents go blind and all sorts of things. But then he learns his lesson and later um, goes and does miracles to reverse all of the cursings and things that he did while he was being mischievous. It's, it's a really interesting read. And why not include the gospel of Peter or the apocalypse of Paul or the apocalypse of Peter? You know, there's, there's so many books of scripture that did not make it into the canon and modern members of the church just assume that this canon that they have is inspired by God, but it came from a time during the great apostasy. And interestingly, so many of the core beliefs of the church come from this time of the great apostasy. There were other branches of Christianity that had distinct ideas and distinct ways of rationalizing the events of Christ's life, but they all ultimately died out. The Gnostics or the Marcionites or the Ebionites and, and various other uh, followers of Christ from that time that had distinct ideas about who he was and what his mission was um, than the modern churches of today have. <laughs> that was a long way to say that Everything that we have in scripture can be traced directly back to the arm of flesh. It comes from man, both man writing it and men determining what is and is not acceptable scripture. A believer, on the other hand, could come to a discussion like this and make the claim that Joseph Smith did see God the Father and Jesus and various other scriptural passages like the Mount of Transfiguration or, or other stories from the scriptures where there was this supernatural visitation from God, where God's voice was heard, you know, a burning bush and whatnot, where these accounts relay a story about God, where it was a personal account or a personal witness of an interaction with God. And I'm not here to say that those things did or didn't happen. I've come to my own conclusions on those. The, the point of this discussion is to say that, let's just say that, yes, Joseph Smith did see God in the grove. The only person that would have this witness that isn't the arm of flesh would be Joseph Smith. Anybody that he told is not getting a witness that isn't the arm of flesh. So unless you have a personal visitation or a personal revelation, nothing that you learn or receive from the scriptures or from the prophets comes directly from God without passing through the arm of flesh. And that's the point that this essay is trying to hit on. 
I don't say this to to tell the listener that they can't believe or that they can't have faith in God. It brings up the question or the concern for a believer that they might look at this and say, how do I know when the prophet is talking as himself or as talking as the mouthpiece of the Lord? How do I know when a doctrine or a concept that is being taught today won't be retconned with the next prophet? The name of the church, blood atonement, Adam, God, the curse of Cain. We could list a number of different doctrines. The reason we're all here at at a podcast like this or with with any of these post-Mormon discussions is because we've encountered these things. We see this discrepancy. So the question is, how do you know when it's the arm of flesh or when it's coming directly from God? All bring it back to the scripture I cited from Jeremiah in the beginning. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, that maketh flesh his arms, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. And then a verse uh, verse later in uh, Jeremiah 17, 7, he says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. I'm not here to disparage anybody that believes or that finds Uh, comfort in believing in God or in uh, a religious context. That's fine. The question that I hope to put into somebody's mind is, how do you know the difference between what is coming from man and what is coming from God? Is there a tried and true method of discerning what that is and what that looks like? And if so, what is it? And where can we learn it? it? Creates this kind of circular problem where You can't trust the the arm of flesh, but everything that we know comes from the arm of flesh. So we can't trust the very source that's telling us what we're supposed to know and not know. It's just a little bit of a conundrum for a believer. But I think that this is where faith comes in for those that do still believe. Where they come to these discrepancies in doctrines and beliefs and they come to these problems and they, they have faith that the revelation and the teachings that they have received up until this point is true and accurate. For me, that's what real faith actually is. The Book of Mormon actually says that explicitly when it defines faith. And this this quote comes from Alma 32.21, which is kind of a rewriting of Hebrews 11.1. In Alma it says, And now, as I said, concerning faith, Faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. Trusting in the arm of flesh and trusting in the arm of the Lord is where a believer comes to this information and decides that when they're trusting in this scripture or this prophet over that prophet or, or this other scripture or this church over another church, That is them deciding and having faith and hope in one version of religion over another. When at their core, they all come from man. That isn't to say that you can't believe that they're divinely inspired. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that everything we are taught comes from humanity. Any method that a religious organization recommends to use as a way to determine which things come from God and which things are creations of man are unreliable. The same method for finding out if the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true is the exact same method that a Hindu or a Jew or a Muslim or a Jehovah's Witness or any other faith. The method of praying and getting a comforting feeling is the exact same method used by all of these organizations to receive a confirmation that what they're doing is right. It's this Moroni's promise concept. But the problem with this promise is that it leads to interpretation based on the individual. And there doesn't appear to be a tried and true method of determining the veracity of any religion over any other religion, not in a way that produces a consistent result for every single person 
that asks this question. Trust in the arm of the flesh, trust in man, or trust in God. To me, there doesn't seem to be a discernible way to identify when a person is trusting in God or when a person is just trusting in their instincts or in what another man has taught them about God or about religion. A subject that is typically presented in such black and white terms when examined and thought about, and there doesn't appear to be any black or white on their own. It is all mixed in to gray. Did we solve anything with this discussion? Probably not. It's important to think critically about the things that we believe and think in order to make certain that we're basing our decisions and our judgments on sound reasoning. Self-reflection and analysis is an important skill to practice. Thanks so much for listening today. And thanks, Brock, for this awesome essay that you sent me. It was thought-provoking and was a great jumping-off point for the discussion that we had today. A couple of things that I've got coming up. I'm going to do an episode discuss- discussing Under the Banner of Heaven. When this episode comes out, the last episode of the show will have aired, and I am hopefully going to touch base with RFM and have a chat with him about both of our thoughts on the show, and that hopefully will come out next week. I'm working on some good things that are going to come out in the next couple of weeks. I do have some vacations planned for this summer, but I hope to be able to record episodes beforehand so that so that I can continue to post content even though I will be out of town for, for a little bit. Wherever you find yourself out there, finishing up the workday, vacuuming the family room, I hope that you have an excellent day. Day.